Hey guys, I'm glad that you are all here today for Lunch at Lift. We have Tom Miller. <laughs> He's going to be interviewing Keith Thode. And so I'll let you take it from there. Welcome. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Thank and you. thank you, uh, Lift Office and, and Facebook uh, uh, people out there. So, Keith, um, Chief CEO and Chief Scientist at Advanced Net Labs. That's right. That's a mouthful. So I want to understand a little bit more about the CEO and Chief Scientist things. But first, um, thanks for coming on. So uh, Vanderbilt, undergraduate degree, Texas A&M, Masters. How'd you go from Tennessee to Texas? Which, by the way, is a great progression from yeah, state right. to state. That's happened a lot at yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah. It's Davy Crockett. Says, right, right, right. right, right. right. Yeah. So, yeah, right. So, um, I actually grew up in the Northeast in Boston and upstate New York. And um, I was actually at a management camp. Uh, I was the local scholarship kid in a, kind of a rural community that um, for a management camp. And my cabin mate, you may have heard Dollar General stores, yeah. was Cal Turner the Third. So, his dad is Cal Turner Jr., who flew in on his helicopter to come lecture us on management principles and he said you should look at and so my roommates said, you should really look at in Nashville at Vanderbilt and I grew up in the north like a couple of our Colorado friends here and uh, went down to visit Vanderbilt around this time of year and barely got out of New York because of the snowstorm and could play golf in my t-shirt and shorts and I said I don't have to be cold anymore so <laughs> I went the south looked pretty good the south yeah. looked pretty good so I went right. to school in Nashville Tennessee right. um, and then family things. Eventually, after some stints in um, Chicago and Hong Kong and Korea, ended up uh, here because of family reasons. Oh, so, cool. Okay, yeah. so I'm, I'm gonna, I, I know you as the cool guy that I met through Chuck Finney, and you know you're you're personable and engaging, and you have good conversations. And we all got this perception of kind of the scientist types as not that. Uh -huh. But now I hear that you went to a management camp. Like in high school, uh -huh. so there is a, like a real inner geek that it, you kind of on. Inner okay, geeks <laughs> for a long time. Right? That's right. <laughs> okay, so now fast forward, um, you know, you had a career in in consulting and popped around the world a little bit. CEO and chief scientist of Advanced Net Labs. Talk about your current role and what you're doing. Sure, sure. So Advanced Net Labs, we. Basically, our premise is that the for-profit world has developed these technologies and ways of doing business that have really been um, beneficial for most of society. It's raised the standard of living of everybody in this room. So how do you take those same capabilities and apply them to people for whom the economy hasn't quite worked for yet, mm -hmm. right? Or they're affected by a crisis, like a domestic violence situation. So mm -hmm. um, so th with the labs, we kind of experiment with those, those ideas and try to make them actually work for these vulnerable populations. And when we can do that, then we kind of commercialize them and off they go. Um, when did that start to hit your radar? When did this switch flip from for-profit world to business in a nonprofit benefiting uh, populations that are struggling? Yeah, so the um, from a pretty early age, actually, from a personal concept. So um, my when I was in uh, high school, I was a musician. And actually, my high school plan was um, when I was a Good musician, but not a great musician. Mm. But I've always been good at organizing things. Mm. So my original goal was to be the business manager of a symphony. And I Boston would, Pops or well, probably second tier like Philadelphia okay. or somewhere, right? right? Yeah. Where they would let me play. I, I'm good enough to play like mm. third chair, but then I would run the books and the business, and yeah. that's that was. Ah. So I always thought I would bring that organ those organizational concepts. Mm. Mm. Um, I went to my first job at a consultancy called Accenture and basically went there because part of the promise was you'd learn so much in a very short amount of time. Um, and my goal was always to kind of, from a pretty young age, to go learn enough and earn enough at the same time. Not that necessarily I could retire, yeah. but actually a little later than now, five years from now, but that my kids' college would be paid for and um, things like that. And I could work for not very much doing at the time, I thought it was going to be finance and business administration mm -hmm. type work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, and then I was working for a software company and um, doing logistics work. So the, the movement of goods, of raw materials to making products and then getting them out to the store. I mm -hmm. um, was working for a company doing that and one of the other employees said, boy, I really wish I had had this technology in my last role with the DOD doing relief work in Kosovo. We should really donate this software into the nonprofit world. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it was just, I wish I was brilliant, the brilliant guy who came up with it, and I wasn't. But um, uh, I just thought that was amazing. I was a volunteer into the company foundation at that time. Right. So I helped start the Skunk Works project to uh, actually make that happen. And okay. um, eventually, uh, 
a lot of that was being funded by the company. I was volunteering my time, but we had a paid team working on it. Right. Well, if you follow software companies, they often do well and then not so well. Yeah. So as that started to happen, that team had to pull back and the foundation staff said, well, what are we going to do? And the, the team said, well, Keith's doing it for free, so maybe he'll do it full time for not very much. <laughs> and uh, my wife is very generous and uh, believes in you know um, us doing the good work. So they, dub they, they doubled your free salary exactly. and off you went to, uh, to work somewhere. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. So I got to do it for not very much. Became yeah. the CFO of that foundation okay. as, an, as a vehicle to incubate what became a company called, a nonprofit called Aid Matrix. And okay. it's. Um, you know, over the time of our session today, a million pounds of food is going to get delivered over the systems that we oh, cool. built 10 years ago. Wow, that is so cool. Yeah. You're going to do one of these. Uh, yeah. Pound that. Yeah. Uh, yeah that, I'm, that's good. Yeah. I feel like just as you think about innovating things you do in your life, I mean, from a career perspective, I feel like I'm playing with kind of house money just off that one thing yeah. because it continues to go and do well. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, kill it. So, so Advanced Net Labs, what are some examples of projects that you're working on now? Yeah, great. So the um, so for example, um, and we have things that have more commercial application and things that more are just they're just going to help people, mm -hmm. and we just try to get them to be just barely sus financially sustainable. Um, one that falls into the latter bucket is we have we've developed a set of technologies, including an app called Safe Night, and you know with that, um, people who've downloaded our app help solve a problem that about forty percent of the time when someone calls a shelter. Um, usually a woman, but sometimes a man, um, they're told, I'm sorry, the shelter's full, or you have a teenage son, the shelter can't handle men. Um, and so now instead of saying no, the shelter can say, hold on a minute and put an alert out over our app. And if you've downloaded the app, the thing will ping you and say, if you can give me $60, this is one from last night, $60 and 79 cents. I can put somebody in a room tonight instead of leaving them on the street. Will you make the donation? Hmm. That's so, cool. yeah. so that's a, that's a example. We do some work there. Then we do some more sophisticated things around rare blood matching. So, and again, there's big commercial systems for trading generally Keith's unit of A positive blood and getting it to someone who needs it. But if you have a very rare condition or you're highly sensitive to go find a very specific match of blood that's genotyped to be a pretty exact match to what you need, there's not a lot of money to be made in that. And so there wasn't big, these big commercial systems mm -hmm. built. So to the leading the head medical lead of the blood centers in New York and Seattle and I got together and built a little system to make that oh, work wow. and cool. get those units matched to people who need it. And now it got picked up by the American Association of Blood Banks and it's when you say picked up, did they are they using it, monetizing it? How does that how does it perpetuate the work that you do at Advanced Net Labs? Yeah, excellent. So originally the docs and I so they were doctors. So we had to like we built the technology but also all the business planning and that sort of thing. But then we found um, we actually got some pretty good recognition in an industry journal. Mm -hmm. And then the American Association of Blood Banks called us up and said, we have some similar operations. We would really love to take this over. And so now how this works from an operational arrangement is that they market it, they receive most or some of the monies, and then we get kind of a fixed amount to continue operating and continuously improving the tech platform. Yeah. So now they're running the business side of it. So there's a question that keeps coming into my mind. So often, I'm going to generalize a little bit. So often, when we, the big universal, we think about doing good things, it's stopping to pick up a piece of litter or it's donating, you know, to do it. So it's, it's, it's um, saying yes to that $60.79. Yeah. So it's that one thing. Yeah. It seems like such a challenge to create scale around that. And you've done that multiple times. Mm -hmm. How do you, what are the typical challenges? What goes through your head? I'm, I'm, what I'm wondering is how do you think to, if I'll pick up a piece of trash, but creating an organization that will do good in scale like that. So what do you say, a million pounds of food in the hour we're going to be doing this? That's yeah. huge. Right. What's the, how do you think? What's, what goes through your head on that? Yeah, you really have to put a couple of different lenses on it. You do have to bring what I would call some traditional business or operational thinking to it because you can't take every good project that comes down the, the, the pike. We mm. do a mix, like, like I said, we do some things that we know will never be have a financial return. Right. And we have some, do some things that we think, well, oh, we can maybe get this up and kind of, technology is right. expensive to build and to put in. It's not as expensive but to then run. then once you get yeah, it up, yeah, yeah there it goes. Up. Right. So a lot of our, how it goes through our thinking is looking at that analysis of 
how can we build something, and you said the word scale, which is critical, right? How can we build something that we think we can help bring scale to the sector? Mm -hmm. And then when it's at scale, do our costs of running it and our revenue that we can generate out of it at least equal up? Right. And then we have some things like in the education and workforce development space where we actually believe there's a lot of profitability to be had at the same time. And so in that case, we've actually started in July a for-profit company. And we've got, we're out seeking seed capital and that's a new world for me. We've got some seed funding and we're talking to venture capital firms and can you, like can you talk about the for-profit stuff? So yeah, what, what, what is, what is it? What are you doing? Yeah. So um, with that, we're really focused on educating and employing people on the margins. Yeah. So uh, again, back to our premise, you know, how, how does Bank of America, um, UPS, Neiman Marcus, how do they educate their, their employees? They don't bring them all into a room and like at the Bank of America down the street here. They don't bring the new employee into the room and the manager reads from a PowerPoint the same thing and then and deals with them all in person and then the next person comes in and she has to stop what she's doing. No, but in the nonprofit world, a lot of our training works that way. Mm -hmm. So we've brought the tools, in fact, the same exact core system, for example, Bank of America uses to, to help train people. We have a bring e-mentoring platform and now just like at Bank of America where 80% of their training is online and maybe 15% um, of their training is online, but I'm going to sit at my desk and listen while somebody from San Francisco talks to me live, kind right. of like today. Right. And 5% of it is, there's the bathroom, there's Chuck, he gets yeah. sleepy after four, don't ask him math questions then, and you know, those, that type of stuff. Yeah. So how do you apply that to vulnerable populations? Like our returning military vets. So we're doing right. something with Easter seals and returning military vets or, um, you know, people who've been through some kind of addiction kind of skilled up and then also get electronic dossier of them of all their work and experiences mm -hmm. so that employers can go look for them and they can look at somebody they wouldn't have looked at before right but and there's two elements to that is a because they don't have a western degree right they have they come from some other background mm -hmm. but it's also currently you know the nonprofit world tries to get the corporate world to hire their people by oh let me email them a resume yeah Okay, nobody hires that way anymore, right? I mean, corporations log into systems, they do searches and analysis and pull it right. And so now we've got systems that can talk like that right. so that they can look at people at scale. You right. talked about scale. As more, the more little groups we bring on or community colleges mm -hmm. and nonprofit yep. groups, the bigger our database gets nice. and the more valuable that is to the employers to say it's worth it. Right. So a group we work with, in South Dallas does tech training. All on their own, they've got 15 graduates every 12 weeks. It's great, but it's 15 graduates. Is AT&T really gonna take their time right. to go look, I mean, to look at the email, resume? No, right? Right. But now if I can log in as AT&T and see like programs that all around the country and do heat mapping between what my, my needs are and what's in the database, it becomes good business for me. Right. And so that's another critical point as we look at the sustainability is how can we bring in the corporate sector and not just how do we how can we talk them into it but how do we make it good business for them mm -hmm. so on the food bank side those first systems like it's now profitable for those food companies to donate their surplus food really and from a tax you know, credits or from a net operating profit after taxes okay, standpoint right. right so we've optimized the value proposition the um, or one of our bigger ones uh you know had a whole team out converting plants to using our system huh. because it was it got to do good, but it was actually profitable for them. Right. They can invest their time and money. So one of the things we kind of bring to philanthropy and um, is how do we make it good business for right. corporations? And when we do that, then you get per permanently sustainable things. Right. I get to say the system we built 15 years ago is off and continuously running, right? Right. Because it's creating real value for each of the parties. I, I love that thinking. I think because that is, you know, we think, well, you could look at that in a way as well. You're you're giving them a reason too, so it's going to be selfish and act. No, it's. I mean, it, if everybody wins, then you're going to get more right. money, more funds, more interest. And sometimes, I mean, I'm guessing. I'll let you answer. Is it about? Is it more about money or is it more about interest? Would you rather have AT and T's money or would you rather have their focus? Yeah, the focus is the long term. Yeah. Right. And we need seed money from different places. We can go to a wider variety of sources for for let's call it seed funding to get projects off the ground. Right. Private foundations and, right. and things like that. Um, but in general, if we can have a combination, ideally from a corporation, of their money and their people, um, you know, and some of their core capabilities, like their training or mm -hmm. their, but we want to get out of the philanthropy department, right? 
and into the business units. Right. Right. Because that's where this stuff is permanently sustainable. Right. What are the, when you go to a new um, business to say, hey, I think we've got, we've got an idea that we think can help your business um, and you can, can feel great about what you're doing. There's a conscious capitalism movement right. that I love that kind of does that. What are the key things they're looking for? What are the first three things that you want to share with them about what you're doing and how they could respond? Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, the first thing is being pretty clear about your mission and what you're doing. But pretty quickly after that is showing that you understand their business and how they, how they make money and how they make impact mm -hmm. and, who's, and who's important to them. Right. A lot of times these value chains, we'll talk about just AT&T, for example. AT&T spends a lot of money with a lot of other companies. Understanding those relationships is, can be very helpful. Um, you know, but then you know, the third thing is employee engagement. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you four, but and is employee engagement, yeah. right? And that happens pretty, how can my employees be involved? Because while some of the business case may take time, most organizations have employees that want to do something good, right? Right, But it's just hard. We'll talk about the mentoring piece we're talking about, but it's hard to drive to South Dallas every Thursday. And like, yep. you know, how can we make it easy for their employees to engage? Which is, you know, it's helpful because the corporation has their metrics and such, but also, it helps make that employee sticky to their employer. I mean, employee-employer relationships are so fractured these days. People don't stay right. places very long. If they believe their employer is someplace special, they will stay longer. Mm -hmm. Part of how you do that is showing that real connection to the community. Hmm. And, and giving important. people choices about, you yep. know, so if I want to pick up trash, now I can scale that yep. across the system that you've built. And if I want to pick up trash, that's great. But if I want to use my accounting skill or my, mm -hmm. right? then there's opportunities that way as well. Cool. That's what that skills-based volunteering, we call that. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then the fourth thing is how do you make the long, what's the long-term partnership, mm -hmm. mutual benefit? You know, to the extent that we could, I mean, it's a real, it's what makes long-term success. And, all, and it's also a different, honestly, from other people trying to talk to that company. Most of them aren't trying to talk to them about that, that final pillar. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you share from an Advanced Net Labs perspective about the benefit of a long-term partnership with you and your company? Yeah, I think a lot of it is that is under a general standpoint is that we understand both sides, mm -hmm. right? And so we understand how to create that long-term relationship that has the business rules that works for everybody. Um, and it's just most people from, and most of the time in the philanthropic sector, um, they don't have that deep understanding and so it's it's two different worlds, and so you only end up dealing with the, the philanthropy department. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when we can have that alignment of vision and, and mutual benefit, like you called it, right? Mm -hmm. right, then the specific projects can fall out. They can involve our tech or not our tech, just our relationships, or right. it could be, right? But it's about you know that strategic relationship with the client. Hmm. So as you scan the horizon, you know, the, the business part of you, you know, you're, you've you've been part of solving for um, feeding people. You've been part of solving for getting people a roof over their heads in a, in a difficult situation. What do you think are the coming challenges that, that are on your radar to think, gosh, we've got to, you know, this is coming. I need to be developing software or systems or something, a tool to go address this. Mm -hmm. That's uh, So the biggest piece there is the education piece, mm -hmm. right? So there's both the economic opportunities there, but it's also our next great, like, why are they hungry in the first place? How can we make systematic change and our you know our constraints are this whole idea of not working at scale mm -hmm. right so how do we create those connections our labor markets are going to you know, as we when we have you know we're at a time where like in this country we have very low statistical unemployment we also have the lowest participation in the workforce in a very long time and that's to me that's problematic mm -hmm. Right. It's um, you know, people just giving up. Is that what you see? Yeah, yeah. People have given up, whether from age or their their social situation. And mm -hmm. right. And so they're just not choosing not to participate. Right. And we really lose not to get on my soapbox, but we lose something. No, our fabric, this is right? your soapbox. Right. Pizza. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we're not I mean, there is there is value in work. Right. Right. And there's dignity in work. And, um, you know, we both proto have friends, you know, our age and slightly older who feel like you can see that that's happened where they feel like sure. the working world has passed them by. Sure. Right. And um, so it happens to, at all places in the spectrum. Um, you know, but there's also, it's also a time of tremendous opportunity because work is becoming more fractioned. Right. right? And so um, how do we, and we sort of feel like there's a tipping point. I mean, you're sitting here and let's take our 
our city just down the street here, Dallas, Texas, right? Right. right. Where you know, you've got um, forty percent of the population is living within one hundred and fifty percent of the poverty line, mm -hmm. right? Which that's like is still pretty darn poor, right? right. I mean, it's just. And, um, you know, and it doesn't matter your political affiliation. The Republican mayor of Dallas will tell you, uh, spoke at an anti-poverty conference saying, this is not sustainable. We cannot right. have an economy like this and a, a community like this with so many people disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so that's the fear and just the opera and the, the challenge and the opportunity is work is going to become more and more smaller by connecting the right people at the right time. You know, young people want to have do more, choose to do more freelancing relationships, right. right? So it's creating, it's forcing those who are demanding labor to actually look at these more creative Right, solutions. so it's just sort of that slang term, the gig economy, yeah, and yeah. the sharing economy. And yeah. so you think, that's what I'm hearing you saying, you know, fewer people on payrolls perhaps, but more job opportunities if you've got the skills to meet a specific niche in the marketplace. Absolutely. It's going to be, and so how do we create people that are ready for those niches? Right. Right? And it's... um. You know, and I mean, in a, in a big macro way, no matter what happens with computers and, and all this stuff, like we're talent constrained, mm -hmm. right? So if we can raise more talent and right size talent, right, right, then we can provide economic uh, economic and dignity opportunities for huge amounts of so for society. And it's not just not just about that. It's about our corporate sectors achieving their potential. To right. Innovate they and need. Yeah. They, they need, need people with. So. So this raising the level of talent. That's where you're coming in with education, with training, with a system that can intervene and impact. So what does that look? So we've got some guests from Western State, Colorado University. Some students there. They're at a traditional university, uh -huh. getting the kind of education that you and I got in a traditional yeah. sense of the way. What does an education look like? in your mind in terms of meeting the need in that sector that needs an education that might not be able to go to Western State right. or wherever? Yeah. yeah. So the, you know, the principles, so a couple of the principles are, you know, learning on demand. Mm -hmm. So as you're available, as you're able and short time to value. I mean, the idea to tell somebody on the margins that it's living on the margins, Hey, if you'll just go do, get this two year degree, just do this full time for two years, then your life will be so much better. It doesn't right. work for two minutes. I got two days. Yeah. yeah. Right. I can't try to make a paycheck to paycheck. Right. And my car breaks down, my mom gets sick, and now they've invested however many months of right. money in. I mean, so and they've got a loan, and yeah. now yeah, right. it just gets worse. It's worse right. and worse. So right. short time, to use business terms, short time to value. How can we get somebody equipped for work in this economy that pays a living wage? right as quickly as possible and then give them opportunities to move up and by the way those opportunities aren't necessarily going to be provided by us all the time mm -hmm. so let's take medical so somebody somebody wants to be a nurse you know a uh, uh, young person i've had a relationship with growing up wanted to be a nurse you know and, and you probably know people since she she didn't have a lot of money so she bartended her way through getting her nursing degree okay Sound familiar? Yeah. Right. All right. <laughs> what if instead she got a? We quickly got her trained up with a cert, and she became a certified med tech. Mm -hmm. And she's probably actually making the, only the same or slightly less, less money, but she's, you know, but she's in the hospital, in the field, right? In the field, being seen by the docs and the hiring people. Yeah, Absolutely. You know, she and then she continues to work on her education. Well, it's not very long if she's a good worker these days. There's such a star for talent that. They'll actually lean forward and help pay for some of that, provide some direction for that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you're figuring out whether you actually like this or not. So those are a couple of principles. The other one is to really focus on, um, you know, for this type of education, the training that the market's demanding, right? So, I mean, you have personal choice in what you choose to do in careers, but so rather than taking, no offense to our professors, but the, the hearing from what the professor thinks people ought to be learning Okay, if I want a job with AT and T, since that's what we talked about, mm. what if I take AT and T's training? How about the training AT and T's already giving to their employees? Yep. So we're taking, we have the systems to push to receive that from them and push it out. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's some other great innovations happening outside mm -hmm. of what we are doing. Like right. we take the very systems type <laughs> approach, but even in Dallas School District, just to stay with that example of AT and T, there are AT and T is sponsoring 200 seats in a high school hmm. where. Kids sign up as freshmen, and for the four years, they do a very specific curriculum. And when they're done, 
they get an associate's degree. So when, they're, when they graduate high school, they finish also with an associate's degree, and they're on this very specific curriculum from AT&T that they are guaranteed an interview with AT&T. And nice. Yeah, because they've been trained. The right. industry has dictated. Right. Now, that's only 200 slots, right? And there's maybe 2,500 slots right now across DISD, across tens of thousands of students. So how do we... Jump, the, yeah, jump. Yeah, and that's yeah, what we're right, trying right. to drive sure, sure, sure. with technology. Cool, very cool. Yeah. So, what's it like? I, 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 you know, your passion oozes out of you, and and the your vision for this. What's it like to work for Advanced Net Labs and to work for Keytho? What are the kind of people that come to work with you in your organization? Yeah, we have because of what we do, we attract some really neat talent. Yeah. So a diverse set of talent because. Um, as you said in the beginning, you know, the inner nerds kind of look at me and go, that's pretty cool. I would like to do something. <laughs> I get that. this guy. I get yeah. this guy, right? right. So, that's, so that's really helpful. Um, I'll say that uh, people that do well are entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. At the phase we're in and the size we're in, we have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of independence and there's a lot of dependence on you having an owner mentality. So, um, and it's, and it's a business cycle phase, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're two years into the main operation, the company and the company we started in July. So, um, you know, the place we were before when we started, I started the first, the food banking work mm -hmm. 15, 16 years ago, the joke was there were six of us programmers sitting around and the other five looked at me and said, you're a pretty bad programmer. Why don't you go raise some money? <laughs> and so, and that's how I got to be the boss. So, um, they still talk about you behind your back. Or they just tell you directly, you go do that. We got this. Yeah. One of them still works for me across four companies 16 years great, later. Yeah. Great. yeah. Um, yes. So, but, and it was very, into, but that grew to be a hundred person company mm -hmm. and not right. And, and that became a more diverse workforce. Right. Um, so the, with people who were kind of more, like the fact that it was stable and it had a stable paycheck and it had good benefits package and all that right. stuff drew them. You know, this, we're in a um, more entrepreneurial phase. You have a lot, a lot of independence, um, and we're starting transition because we're getting larger. Yep. It's actually one of the challenges, I guess, probably all of our entrepreneurs have is uh, you're trying to, as you get looking at hiring, do I hire somebody that reinforces me and the culture, or do I hire somebody that's complimentary to me mm -hmm. right but there's a little bit of a, a less yeah. direct alignment yeah yeah what have you done to shape culture inside your company i mean i, I hear you the way that you're choosing to hire people and and kind of people that might complement or people that might think differently that do think differently than you yeah. what are some things that you're doing to to engage them as quickly as possible mm -hmm. so at first first we sell on mission in terms of selling to get people to come like i mean we sell on mission yeah. uh, and then we get a lot of exposure to all of the other employees. So they kind of get a feel of whether this is going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, we bring people in and get them. We have an opportunity lots of times for people to volunteer. We have somebody right now that's just starting to engage. And most of the people that work for us volunteered at some point. Huh, cool. So, yeah. Um, so do you look to that volunteer pool for your scanning for potential oh, hires? Absolutely. Okay. Cool. absolutely. Yeah, and we give different tasks to people when we think there's a, a right. track. Um, so that's the, you know, the other piece we try to provide is a lot of honesty and transparency. It doesn't do any good to bring somebody in and have them flame out, yeah. right? right? And because of, so if you can be honest, um, one of the things I try to espouse is transparency as a leader. Mm -hmm. So we have, I try to be pretty self-effacing about, you know, there's things I'm good at and things I'm not, mm -hmm. right? And so like the scientist label, it fits a lot of times, right? Yeah. Where I'm like, okay, let's just go do it. Yeah. And then the, there's the people who actually have to do it. Right. Have to kind right. Of, right. And so, um, you know, or kind of more of the, like, bureaucracy is not all bad. Like the whole mm -hmm. management infrastructure, like, I value that tremendously, but I am not as strong at meeting it out. So I hire complimentary people like that. But. Um, our delivery system. So how we roll out all our technology. So we've hired some people, we've got some better systems in it. It's all organized now as these tasks come in, it's all organized, there's right. staff meeting and there's a system. I love that. I am terrible about being compliant. Yeah. Right? I wanted the system. I don't want to do the system, Right. but I'm the boss. So yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I need the system done. Right, so, right, yeah. cool, good, good. So, um, you know, we've got some, some students here that are sitting in this room and, yeah. you know, we're streaming on Facebook and there are people listening to the, to the people 
I'm thinking, I'm thinking more about the students, people getting out of college, but for anybody who's, who's trying to make a change in their career. So mm -hmm. when you're starting, what would you say to the people getting out of school or making a career change that they ought to be investing in or doing now to hit the radar of organizations like yours or, or like, like any organization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's like, so things you can do before you actually have the interaction, right, are, you know, certifications, tactical trainings, like anything that's, that's like that is more and more, and again, this is, I mean, I was in a uh, regional chamber, uh, Dallas Regional Chamber meeting last week with some industry leaders, including right, our at and and UPS, and, these, yeah. and the idea of these certifications are going to be more and more important. So it's less and less, oh, they went to, they went to Western, they must be smart and brilliant, we'll figure out how to train them on what they need. Right. Right, especially because all that Western person may not stay more than 18 months, so right. I'm not going to take them through the 12 month management training camp like right. some of us when we yep. started out. So, having those specific certifications, even if it's not exactly the job you end up applying for, it shows a capability, hmm. right, and ability to learn technically. Um, when you get to have those interactions, I would encourage still the interpersonal networking events. Mm -hmm. I think younger people. And the both the electronic, um, like so when we work with people who are getting ready to just enter the workforce, I mean, I tell them after I after I give my talk like this or something, I'm like, if you haven't connected with me on LinkedIn after this, like it's a very bad stuff. Right. We didn't have this when we started, right? Right. You know, and it's a tremendous opportunity. Um, but and then the in person networking events for people to see you. Right. Um, and then I would say when you get the chance to interact, like volunteering, participating in even if, if Helping people in the social sector isn't your thing, like, and you think I'm nuts, that's fine. There's there's industry sector stuff, right? right. For every industry, there's a professional society and there's right. meetings. And, um, so go get involved there um, and help with that. And when you do that, show, show things like commitment to detail and being humble and teachable. And, I mean, those are real differentiators yep. these days. Um, you know, I have the, my last hire. Somebody straight out of school who I had some knowledge. I mean, I knew him before a little bit, but I mean, he showed. But big things where he showed a real difference in terms of willingness to kind of get down and work and figure it out, mm -hmm. and not say not my problem, right? Right? Or I got, I hit a roadblock. Help me, right? Right? But also a willingness to take direction pretty early. Yep, it's a real differentiator. So yeah. Yeah. you know, it's interesting. I heard you say this. It's so easy to connect electronically now. Yeah. And sit behind a keyboard and, or, or flash out, you know, resumes. But the human part, I think it maybe is even more important now mm -hmm. because everybody else will take the easy. So if I can get to know you as a human and you can get to know me yep. and I can show you my characteristics and show you what I know, then then I'm so much farther ahead than somebody who's just mm -hmm. blasting out resumes. Well, and it's much, and this would be where you, um, you have very, very uniquely qualified to explain this better than me, but the idea of using that of thinking of it like a funnel, mm. right? So you've got LinkedIn and our networks and you should be <laughs> leveraging that to identify who's my optimal first contacts. Right. But then, Professor Tom, I see you know this person over at UPS and that's really where I'd like to, right. to go and then go have that Help meeting, me out, right? right? But it's a, exactly. as you're looking for jobs, I mean, to look at it like a sales process, mm -hmm. a little bit of scanning the network, having as big a network as possible, finding the connections, you know, and then you know, moving through and. Um, yeah, we are, there's an unhealthy dynamic I think our society is building and that we're more, are more and more, it's easy to stay home. Yep. It's easy to be insulated, mm -hmm. right? And that, and that happens whether you're a Western person ready to graduate and it's just nervous about making, meeting that person mm -hmm. and per, going and meeting an industry professional in person and mm -hmm. what does that look like? Um, it's easy to put that off or choose to do the virtual thing instead of the in-person thing when right. at some time you gotta, you got, you got a relationship, you gotta go see him face right. to face. Um, you know, the, um, you know, and we have that with our people on the margins all the time. So yeah. we're working with the community college and, you know, the, the, one of them was, uh, the administrators was telling me the other day, it's like, you don't know how many times we have people say, I came and drove and sat in the parking lot for a year hmm. and I finally wow. got the courage to go from the parking lot to show and show up in wow, the office. Cool. So you, you need to be intentional about yeah. using that electronic. We have the opportunity like never before. Right. Because, but don't use it as an artificial crutch right. to delay 
that's just the beginning. The electronic piece is just the beginning, and then you got to go get face to face and kind of heart to heart almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Cool. Cool. How do you though get that opportunity to the mom who has three kids who's right there on all she could do to put food in their mouths? How do you how do you reach that person? And get them the education they need. So right, you've got or to even help them have a vision that they can get education in. Yeah, I think you know. Again, a lot of how you actually, we work, tend to work with people who have that really relationship. So we'll talk about the Salvation Army. Um, uses our systems to do um, uh, domestic violence survivors, right? And getting them, amongst other things, job training. Like, but that's just one of several things. Um, you know, a lot of those relationships have to be very in person, and they have to be personal connection, or they have to be in personal connections. A lot of what we kind of help do, though, is lower the barrier to entry, right? So the idea that, oh, it's two years and I've got to go over it, no, right? It hits you right where you're at. And the more that we can connect, um, we're working on, uh, as Tom called it, the gig economy, the more that we can provide actual employment opportunities, right, that are, it doesn't have to be full-time all at once. And we talk about the, I talk about crowd working in the crowd, right? And, um, so some of you have probably done some of this, right? I mean, the, the crowd doesn't care that you're busy during the afternoons because you, you're picking up your kids from school, right? When you're free, you're free. The crowd, a lot of times, doesn't care how good your English is, right? And it doesn't care, hey, I'm, you know, I'm not, when my meds are out of balance, I'm bad for these two hours, right? It doesn't care, right? Or I'm recover, I've, I've returned home from, you know, combat, something I never had to do, right? And I've got PTSD, and, you know, and I've got, I've got moments that I'm good, right? So too much of the time, what we've done to try to, train and empower people on the margins, I say is they, we try to turn them into key, mm. right? We try to say, okay, I, I'm going to turn you into somebody that, you know, knows how to dress well, speaks perfect English and can show up someplace at eight o'clock every morning and stay until five every night, no matter what, you know, and so it's how do we lower the barriers to entry? And then the employment piece is big because you're just putting, because they also can get paid. <laughs> Right, so how do we make it so it works for her? Well, part of how we make it work is as quickly as possible, we put money in their pocket, right? We give them those and their amount because now they earn their own money, right? And that short-term encouragement, not just the reality of the financial piece, but the encouragement that, oh, I can do this. I'm on a path. It's taking me somewhere, and I'm getting the fruits from it. So that's a couple of our thoughts on it. Keith, it's been um, cool to sit here. I mean, I've, I've, we're friends, and I've known you, you know, through... Chuck's board and, and seeing you around stuff, but I've learned so much today and I love the transition you made from even where you, your head and your heart though were always in helping people, transitioning to that as a full-time career and building businesses and systems that impact so many. Um, it was really cool. So I love seeing the, the character that you've got impacting communities all over the place, um, all over the world, you know, by the actions that you and your team have taken. So thank you. Thanks for sharing that with all the people that are listening today. No, thank you for the time. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. All right.